<laughs> I, I'm dying for the grace piece. Oh, okay. Dying, unless you want to hold off on that. Yeah, no, I can do that. Um, it's, it's such a, okay. such a wonderful right. piece. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So, Grace, uh, this is from the new book. Um, and uh, to just to, to preface, um, to preface uh, or to introduce the song, two words that you need to, to know to have this make sense, hopefully just two. Um, the word triptych uh, is a house that's on three levels. I lived in one. So you'll hear that. So there's one room on the first floor, one room on the second, one room on the third. Uh, the second word you'll hear that you may not have heard before is a word called the sink, uh, A sink was a, um, is, was a sort of cutting edge digital recording piece of gear that I sold, literally sold my house to purchase. For <laughs> <laughs> the um, tidy sum of $85,000. Oh, Never it was played. Really the days. <laughs> you never played. I never. I never actually played it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have, this is. I lived in it. So this is. Uh, this is Grace. While I was living in my little triptych in the middle of the West Laurel Hill Cemetery outside of Philadelphia, I bought a two and a half active, octave Casio keyboard that sounded like crap. It was portable, so I could take it wherever I was going. I used to put it on the passenger seat of my Subaru on long trips, so when I heard a melody in my head, I'd have some way to work out the pitches before I forgot them. The thing was awful. The keys were too small, the sounds were cheesy, and the speakers were reminiscent of my first and dearly cherished AM tr transistor radio. I traded some of my Barbie doll clothes for that radio in the first grade. I'm not sure the parents of the girl I swapped with would agree that it was a fair trade, but for me, it was the chance of a seven-year-old lifetime. You'd be right to ask why I needed the Casio when I had nearly $100,000 worth of recording equipment in my second floor studio, but the single beer weighed a ton, scared the shit out of me, and was too versatile for my own good. It could do anything I wanted it to, but I had to program it to do those things. The Casio had the advantage of being easy to turn on with built-in rhythms that kept me from having to create my own. It was way more fun to play with, too, so I was considerably more productive with it. The other thing about cheap keyboards is that they always have a synthesized vocal patch that sounds like a thousand angels singing in Westminster Abbey. With the push of a key, a choir will sing, ah, for as many seconds as a finger is willing to hold that key down. I had retreated to my third floor bedroom with my Casio one day when it occurred to me that I wouldn't mind singing with a thousand angels. So I, just lay, down, I lay down on my bed, held down the lowest D flat, and quickly began to sing along. I don't know if you've ever sung in a big choir, but I have, and it's an incredible experience. In high school, I sang in the school choir, of course, and the church choir on Sunday mornings. But in my senior year, I was invited to audition for the Pennsylvania State Choir. I say state, but honestly, I don't remember if it was state, county, or regional. All I know is that it was big and we were good. There were 200 of us. I was an alto. That probably meant there were there, that there were 50 altos, 50 sopranos, 50 tenors, and 50 basses. It was a huge thrill. That many voices can produce a tremendous volume, and the amazing thing is that it can also create the most profound silence. I learned that truth from the conductor the week we rehearsed for our back-to-back -back concerts in what must have been the spring of 1976. He was a master of getting his 200 singers to produce sounds from the quietest pianissimo to a thunderous roar and every level in between. We sang gospel songs like white people do. We sang Barbara and Ives, plus some patriotic tunes that schools insist their children learn. I was second seat, so I sang an eight-measure soul on a spiritual called Deep River during one of our two concerts. As 199 singers hummed as quietly, quietly as they could behind me, I took, a two, a, I took a few steps out from the group and sang my solo as genuinely as I could. There are many moments that I can recall that brought me to where I am now. That solo was one of them. Standing in front of an audience with a crowd of singers backing me up with, was both exhilarating and humbling at the same time. The sound of sustained human voices in harmony is one that has always moved me, but that night was the first time I was aware of it. 
So when I turned on my Casio and played that D flat for what must have been 20 minutes, it made sense that I would sing something that sounded like a hymn. Grace is the song and melody that came out of that third floor experiment. The song is a chant of sorts. It has only one line of lyrics. Thank the world for giving me all the things, all the reasons I have to sing. The rest of the melody is vocalized on various vowel sounds depending on my mood when I am asked to sing it. The first time I sang it for anyone, the most terrifying by far, was in front of my extended family. My father uncharacteristically cut, asked me in advance if I would like to say grace before we ate that night. Grace was customary for our family before every evening meal, including big holiday dinners. In those days, my father usually said grace for the rest of us who chimed in on amen at the very end. Every so often, a sillier grace would follow, like rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub, yay God, but mostly grace was a thoughtful moment in our family's daily ritual. When I sang my grace at Thanksgiving that year, there were 45 family members in two separate rooms, staring up at me from uneven tables, pushed together to accommodate everyone. I was a wreck. There is nothing more terrifying for me than to sing in front of my kin. I think it's because there is so much to lose. If they don't like it, or if they're uncomfortable, or if I'm out of tune or forget the lyrics, they could hate me forever or more. They could reject me, cast me out, be embarrassed by my presence in any, in any room for the rest of my life. But on that day, I did what my father asked. I sang the song, and everyone was quiet. There was no applause afterwards, just the lifting of the forks. I have some grace in some incredible places since that night. On New Year's Eve in 2005, I sang the piece for the first time in the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine in New York City, the largest cathedral in North America. The place was packed with over 3,000 people. You'd think that singing in front of that big crowd would be scarier than singing in my parents' living room for family members, but it wasn't. The spotlights on me were bright enough and the space was big enough that I couldn't see beyond the front row, which was full of people that seemed to like what I was doing. There was no reason to be afraid. There were, I'm just laughing because there was a line there that my, my group on Thursday made me strike. <laughs> it had something to do with bishops and cloaks. And stuff. I thought it was funny, they didn't laugh, so we started. Yeah. <laughs> um, there were virtually no lyrics to forget, and in many ways the melody was up to me. I stood in the center of the sacristy at the front of the church as the organist play, began to play a sustained D flat on one, of the, on one of the pedals of the pipe organ behind me. I'd learned during sound check that there is a six second delay in that church between when I sing and the people in the back finally hear me. Because of that delay or decay time, I sang my lines slowly and waited for each phrase to disappear before I sang the next one. Controlling the time like that was thrilling. The silence between phrases, the harmonics that lingered and bounced off the masonry walls, was as beautiful a sound as I had ever heard. It was sort of hard to believe that it was coming from me. It was as if, a hundred, it, it was as if hundreds of people were singing with me.